Hello, Laurel. Testing, just setting up. I'm trying to position this mirror so you can see me. Not uh, most successful mirror positioning. Let's fiddle around with that. And I'll do. Um, right. So welcome to this morning's live. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Laurel, again. Um, the frame rate may be a bit reduced today. We'll see how we go. Hopefully the audio will um, will be fine, which is the important thing. But you'll miss some of the um, magical finger movement that, uh, that you often see on these lives. So thanks for um, coming along, everyone. I'm sure the uh, viewers will pick up during the session. This um, session is very much about creating uh, patches or creating a, a series of patches and voices to perform live. I've, uh, as I said in the description, I've got some, I've changed the layout and I'll describe that first, but roughly the session's going to be about the, um, about the patch, so a talk, demonstration, and then we'll move into a performance. So I think it's probably going to be roughly an hour of tutorial and then an hour of performance or thereabouts, hopefully quicker on both of them. So hopefully you can stick around if you're watching this in archive, which most people do, and don't want to ask questions and things, um, then you can skip around and I'll put chapter markers in and so on. And the, um, of course, uh, afterwards you can ask comments, ask questions, sorry, in the comments anyhow. So hopefully if there's any um, audio issues, just shout out in the comments and I can fix them. <coughs> One of the main, audi main uh, audio issues may be me coughing. Sunday morning coughs. We've just had our clocks go back uh, an hour, so this is an hour later, I think, for the rest of the world, but I think YouTube takes that into account whenever there's daytime savings or not in different countries, but we'll see. Not many um, viewers at the moment. Right, let's uh, get into it. I'll uh, briefly describe what's been going on with this little modular setup. And by the way, this modular is only one sort of part of my musical arsenal. I've still got the electrons, which I use regularly, particularly the Analog 4s and the Digitact. And I've got the little Volker setup, and I've got, what else have I got? Um, another sort of cheaper modular system, a Behringer 1, which I use for things like um, Hello. Things like uh, Berlin school sequencing and things like that. But this one is now sort of quite flexible and I'm getting close and that's one of the um, issues with modular is as you gradually add more and more and take things away you sort of get closer to what you need out of a system. And um, given that this is portable and it's got 35 modules and there's a lot in here. It's very... Um, very dense and compact. It's not like some of the modulars that you see where they have three or four big um, like mutable instruments, maths and plates and things. Lots of space. This is getting sort of quite dense. Um, but there's a lot in here and that's what I want to go through today. Um, the way I've uh, configured it... <coughs> I'll just have a drink. And my voice settles down after I get going. The way it's sort of laid out at the moment is now I've got uh, the sequencing side very much in this top left corner, sequencing on clocks. So we've got the qubit bloom, which is a fractal sequencer. We've got the ornament and crime hemispheres, which is sort of two utilities, but it's sequencing and all sorts of things and Turing modules. Then uh, another new element is uh, Pam new Pamela's new workout, which is the de facto clock 
uh, modulation system, eight outputs. Then my trusty IntelliJ Steppy, which is a four channel gate system. And then I've got the random modules, which I use for partly sequencing as well. These two, uh, which have sample and hold and can be clocked. And then I've got the ARP, which is a built-in arpeggiator and can be random. Down here, the Turing module as well, which is another form of sequencer. So all of those in combinations, this is the two channel, this is up to two channel, PAMS is like eight channel, this is four channel. So lots of sequencing options flowing from the left, top left side of this into all the sounds and all the sounds are sort of down here. So everything from the mini simps, the pluck, the twin waves, the disting EX of course, which is um, a multi-sample, granular, granular type thing. Hello Philip. Um, so that's most of the sounds and then we've I've shifted a couple up here so we've got uh, another mini synth which sort of acts as a bass or a sequence and then uh, drums over the top here the rest of it is sort of slotted in uh, a range of things so like ADSR's pip slope from ALM the same people who make Pamela's workout um, and then filtering so ADSR filtering down here <coughs> we've got a few Quantizers scattered around. Obviously, I do quite musical things with my modular system. And so, obviously, the TikTok quantizer, the um, 2HP tune. And then the little gap that's here is um, usually a mosaic quantizer. Also, the hemispheres can act as quantizer. And their quantizers are things that put everything in tune, of course. And then over on the bottom right, where my hand dwells a lot of the time when I'm doing arrangements is of course the um, the mixers. So we've got two stereo four channel mixers here which get sent up to this first effects unit. So this, so this is like mixing, this is um, effects and mastering if you like. So we've got a, a um, Happy Nerding uh, FX8 XL from Ukraine, uh, two of them. Um, so what this mixer goes into this one and then this mixer joins it up with it at this sort of uh, sub mixer type situation this mix up into this FXL and then this all goes into this um, uh, little headphone line out type thing here and there are a few mults scattered around which are used to duplicate signals audio <coughs> but mostly CV and gates. And uh, that's kind of it. And of course we've got the Q Nexus, which has got two modes. One of them is um, CV and gate, which I may or may not connect up today. But I've also got a MIDI expander, which is a little box around the back here, which is um, connected to the, the DX. Uh, da -da -da. So DX, no, it's EX, distinct EX. DX, I haven't only thought them. Um, so that is uh, midded in, which allows me to do polyphony. Um, which uh, is obviously not possible through just the CV gate. Right, and so let's get into this sort of tutorial thingy. Um, and what, what I thought I'd talk through mainly is how I patch for performance. Um, so when I create a, if you like, a sequencer into a voice, how I make it so I can evolve it during a live performance, which is what I'll do afterwards. And so it's gonna be very much about, you know, this talks to this, and the reason I do it that way is because I can evolve the, um, just move my mic so I can get over here, adjust the levels, and it's mainly so I can <coughs> during a piece take it from like a nice slow ambient thing into something a bit more rhythmic and dancey and then out into something a bit more abstract and so on so each, each the, the reason i do certain things is so i can um you know evolve each part the uh, bloom i've only had it for about three days but i'm having a lot of fun with it it's a great little 
sequencer in itself. It can be just a straightforward uh, 32 step sequencer if I want it, just straight change the notes. And it's two channels, you can flip between them, there's blue and green, green's the second channel, blue's the first channel. Uh, but it's also got some generative elements like uh, mutation, so you create a pattern as you'll see in a minute, and you can also ask it to take it somewhere else, choose different notes, and then you can also say keep what I've done, but um, vary it. Um, oops, don't know why um, Philip's comment is held for review. Yeah, the Akari has been sort of replaced by this. I've actually moved the Akari sequencer, which is the circular one, over to my um, Berlin School type thing, because it's a nice performance one. This is performance as well, um, but two channel, and it does very much the same things. I've put it um, top left. A lot of the time I'm fiddling with positions of the modules, uh, just to make it more fluid when I'm performing, and particularly if you've seen recent videos where I'm out on the coast, I kind of want to know where things are and I can get to them if I'm out, you know, playing on a cliff edge or on the seashore. It's also it's knowing <coughs> where my hand's going to fall and how it's going to work easiest. So let's um, get into it. <coughs> it's coughing and spluttering. Um, it's actually gone very cold here in the Blue Mountains in Australia in the last couple of days and I was out last night doing astrophotography in um, sort of seven degrees centigrade. It doesn't sound a lot but um, it's like the first cold days of the year so that's why I've gone a bit croaky. And so yeah, uh, any questions as I go through uh, please ask. So let's just um, <coughs> Get into the first one. Um, so I think I'm, in the description I sort of said I'm, what sort of voices I'm going to do. The first one is going to be nice, easy, straightforward. It's just taking um, CV out of channel one of Bloom, put it into this mini synth down here, <coughs> and then taking a, a gate as well. And you can hear that playing. So this is a um, this is an analog synthesizer, and obviously for performance I can do everything from adjusting the frequencies, uh, resonance, all of that's built in, as well as an envelope and so on. I might turn, make sure I turn the instruments up because I've listened to things in the past and all of the instruments, oh sorry, the, the music itself, have been um, low in the mix when I'm speaking. So what's happening here is uh, this this bloom is playing one note. I've got control. Notice the placement. I think Patrick's just said um, yeah, placement's important. I've actually created this so I can grab the left side of the rack here um, and be able to adjust some key parameters of bloom. So one of them is for example length. So I can press the shift key with my thumb and then just click length here and that gives me gives me, you know, I can make it two steps, I can make it three steps. Just turn the um, delay off for a moment. Um, four steps, five steps. And I can also adjust the tempo, press the shift with your thumb and make it slower make it faster. Because um, I've got this left channel mixer going through this FX aid, I've, um, I've got PAMS here set to 124 beats a minute as a master clock, which allows me to adjust and fix um, delays and things. to the, the patching. So you can see the ability to bring effects in and out, pretty important. Change the feedback on the fly up here in the top right. Over here I can change the, the length, I can change the notes. Let's just change it to a simple two steps so I can change the notes for you. 
and you can see I'm actually the ability to be changing notes in this corner and simultaneously adjusting volumes or panning. Let's like put that one. That's one of the things that um, traditional doors. A lot of people, you know, people ask, what's the reason for? Um, why do you do hardware stuff? It's because you can do multiple things at once versus using a mouse and doing one thing at a time. That's one of the advantages of it. Um, so that's just one sequence. I can take the gate um, from Bloom itself, and you've got control. If you press one of these keys in, you can change the gate length of each of these. But of, of course I've got an ADSR down here as well, so that's sort of overkill. But one of the things I like to do is mix things up a bit. So the reason I've got Steppy synced, in fact I'll go through this in a second, like part two, just go through this configuration from PAMS. Um, so on Steppy track A, I can take, say for example, the gate from there, playing roughly the same thing but of course I've got live control on Steppy I can change the probability um, to like 40-50% of it playing if I want to reduce the notes I can set it quite low so that's good if you're doing a build up and you kind of want a sequence to gradually evolve just by increasing the probability in the um, Steppy here, where I mean, this has got oops, sorry, hitting the microphone. This has got a um, Bloom has got a series of things that can also do that. For example, um, if I take let's go back to five steps, I can turn off notes, so just the first two are playing, and that's a good way of evolving it as well. So that's just the first of five steps. I might actually put a kick drum in just to give us a bit of a pulse so you can hear what's going on with various things. Um, so my kick drum's over here. Um, this is just as a bit of a metronome while I'm patching up. And I can take the um, kick drum from PAMS, which is just straight 4-4. Four, four. And you can do a couple of things in PAMS to probability as well, like um, there's a skip step type thing, but for a kick drum you kind of want it constant and then you want to control it, so that's where using Steppy comes in, so I've dedicated channel D on here, let's show you what channel D is doing, to be a kick drum, and during a performance I can quickly switch to like channel D and turn off various steps. Of course, I've got control over the, the various kick drum parameters up here. So if I want to evolve the basic kick drum beat, I can just double it up. Uh, triple it up, that's a word. And then occasionally add in these little, um, little fill type things, which you can't really do on PAM. So that's one of the advantages of having a dedicated gate something that's a bit more flexible. PAMS is all a bit buried in the menu system here. Um, in terms of you have to long press it and then change various functions. I'll go through more of that later when I start using it for sequencing. I just noticed 75 degrees in Mississippi. I'm guessing that's Fahrenheit because otherwise you'd be um, pretty hot if it was centigrade. 20 degrees centigrade in South Australia, very nice. Yes, I think it's about 10 at the moment here. Uh, right, where were we? Yeah, so I'm just, I'll just use this uh, kick drum as a metronome at the moment. So back to, say, track one here, this sequence. So about evolving it, if I want to just add, say, the third step in, just click that. If I want to add the fifth step in, if I want to change any of the, the notes as it's playing, and of course you can get more and more complex in because I'm using track A on the gates. Um, in a minute I can also change the configuration, but it's sort of based on that gate at the moment. So 
what I tend to do is, like I said, put a bit of a grip on the patch, that bloom, the patch cable. So this is Steppy playing all the notes, I think. Check the probability, most of them. And of course I can change the, uh, the steps on here as well. So you can have it. It's almost the same as the bass drum. I can change the overall clock of those sequences. If it goes out of sync, I've got a reset function on here. So that's now playing five steps, but playing them um, the same as the bass drum. If I add a fifth note, and I can make, make it more complex just by adding extra steps here, even though Bloom's not doing anything specifically different. Let's have something pretty regimented. So I'll choose just four steps, and then it'll sound pretty sequence thing going on and add a bit of a square wave to that right the the other thing with bloom just from an evolution perspective and this is where the Hikari sort of fell short because everything was pretty manual I can add in or I can ask bloom to create some variations for me and the simplest way is just to add a branch and a branch is like a based on that four note sequence is going to create a different version of it. I can ask it to create two different versions and play them sequentially. So there's two there. I can also change the path. So the path is like, I think there's four different paths. So as well as ch changing how many branches you've got, you can also change the path which itself takes it into different variations. And of course at any time you can go back to the basic um, pattern. Let's try a different sequence. Um, the more generative side of Bloom is this thing called mutation, which is a bit destructive, so I'll just uh, turn off those notes there, because you can see there's just four playing. When I turn my mutation, it actually starts to vary things. It will change the transposition, oh, sorry, it will transpose the sequence a bit, it will change some notes here and there, it will possibly change the octave, and it's destructive. If you just put a little bit on, you can see it's just changing a couple of notes as I go further to the right and the original sequence is kind of gone now I think you can get it back by pressing shift and reset and it will bring the original one back if you if you really like that one um, and of course the clock is coming from here so if I let's turn all the steps on make the probability quite low. And I can change the clock on here as well to create some cross rhythms, some polymetric cross rhythms. So something a bit bass drum going and just have something a bit more ambient. You can make it a lot slower, both both clocks, so I can change, make the sequence slower and on the fly I can make uh, this clock slower as well, perhaps triplets. So you end up with something quite, um, you know, atmospheric to begin something with probability quite really low. 
So I'll keep that set up for this first track. Second track, I'm going to use Pluck. I'm going to go through these in sequence. But before I do that, so chapter, <coughs> excuse me, um, pre one, so chapter zero, I'll just go through how PAMS is currently set. So I'm using this as a master clock distribution for uh, most of the tracks. Um, so let's go through them. So um, output one is controlling steppy and that's just on a on a 16 note so you can see it flashing there in sixteenths to make to give this the uh, resolution I need um, output two of PAMS is going to bloom so that's controlling the tempo of that and I've got it set on uh, quarter notes you can see that second output so I can, uh, that's got its own internal resolution control um, Three output three on quarter notes as well is going to ornament crimes. And it's actually a Turing machine here called Enigma Junior. So I'm going to use that for bass lines. Um, it's it's kind of very similar to the Turing module Turing machine here, this 2HP one, but it um, needs to be triggered to play these um, various patterns I've got in here. Output four of PAMS is going to this Euclidean circle machine called Annular Fusion, I think it is. <coughs> cough, cough. And that's going to be used for things like percussion and possibly bass drum as well. I've got the flexibility. It's got two outputs. So you can see the um, hemispheres here is a su super useful little bit of gear, particularly for clocking both sides of them separately. And that's on 16th. So the the Euclidean circle is going on 16th. Um, output 5, I'm just using as a reset um, for Steppy because this, this is a bit dumb. It doesn't, when it stops, it sort of stops halfway through a sequence. So I need um, to reset it. So I've used one output. So every time I press start and stop on PAMS, it will reset this to the beginning. So it re remains in sync. And it's good in a performance if things go a little awry here. Because on Steppy, if I press clock and I'm adjusting some of the clocks to like a thirds um, and then to halves and then full and then very slow, sometimes when you switch between them, it goes out of sync. So sometimes you can disguise the fact, um, stop the whole clock system just for a couple of seconds, just leave it hanging and then restart it. And then, you know, you've got this back in sync. The... Um, other parts of PAMS, there's three more outputs left. Um, like I said, seven I could use for a straight 4-4 clock uh, and some variation. Uh, output six, I've got a very slow clock on. I'm going to use that a bit later for some slow harmonic or chordal type things. And then number eight, I'm going to use as a random waveform sequencer because PAMS is more than just modulation and basic clocks it can output quantized notes so I'll use that later so all all the eight outputs of PAM is going to be used just shows how useful it is and more than likely I'll probably need two if I get more into the rhythmic stuff uh, where were we yes back on to the this uh, sequencer so let's let's keep things a bit rhythmic let's bring the kick drum back in just have a look at this one let's have it clocked pretty normal um, and by the way we bloom back to that one uh, mutation if you if you find something it likes you can turn the mutation up you can sort of turn it full to get it to create a new sequence and then just go to the left again it will remember that last last sequence so I'll leave that playing in the background <coughs> I'm going to use um, let's do channel 2 now let's go in sequence so I'm going to use um, output 2 of bloom into pluck and this is going to be a bit of a counterpoint something a bit slower um, probably gated from bloom itself so gate two I need to use a smaller lead for that if I can use smaller cables then I prefer it sometimes 
although, sorry, I'm going to be OCD here. Um, although sometimes a longer one is good for access because one of the things you don't want to do during a performance is sort of block out um, <coughs> steppy, access to steppy, access to the bloom interface, uh, obviously be able to see what pans and ornament and crimes are doing. So there's a bit of this sort of control, the patching that, that goes into live performance. Um, some people, once they've got a patch going, they bundle them all together like that. But um, I, I just like it if they're a bit floppy, you can just sort of get in there. Um, so let's have a look at channel 2 on here. I think it's just set to one note at the moment. Let's increase the step range and the speed of it. So this is just playing three steps, I'm just changing the notes of them. And I did pre-tune the modules before this session, which I always do. So in theory, <coughs> excuse me, in theory it should be in tune, but Pluck has a habit of going out of tune. So I might have to just give it a bit of a kick. If you have problems with tuning, um, I often just go back to one step. Get a sense of the scale. So I'm just using this one tuning uh, note selector here. So finding the root, in this case a C for C minor. And then check it, see if that fits with the everything else. Sometimes I'll do this during a performance itself. So that's not too bad to what I think is possibly the first one's a bit out of tune, so. so let's have a look at that one. So it was the mini synth that was slightly out. I probably just hit the tuning button there. And then um, as I'm creating the patch, I'm constantly. Hello from Japan, hello there. Is there a base? I don't think I've put a base in yet, Patrick. I'm just, um, just checking the comments. And perhaps you call the, the main sequence the base. So they're in tune now, and this um, I'm using this on mini synth as well to keep things in tune. If things go awry, uh, another reference, another reference tuning I can use is uh, the disting. So I definitely want this to be in tune with everything. So a bit of tuning things here. So it was actually Pluck who's being a bit silly. the bass drum Patrick yeah and that's just acting as a bit of a metronome at the moment I can put a bit of click on it it's purely to help me develop the bass patch as we go through this and that's up here okay um, just as a metronome. So that's the second one, um, and likewise with this um, with this pluck, I can do all sorts of things because I'm controlling the speed from here as well on the gate. 
I can, for example, just go super slow and have it occasionally come in. So I can go from that sort of very slow sequence. Let's go into three steps. bass drum and a little, nice bunch of reverb this can be even slower it can just be like a background um, and I'm thinking all the time a bit later on if I want to bring the whole piece down I've got the ability to turn pluck into this background thing super slow and then even uh, I can probably put it on branches so it's constantly varying And then immediately, well not immediately, I could, for example, slowly increase the tempo and gradually bring the bass drum back. And so the three things there, gradually bringing up the bass drum and possibly percussion if I had that going. And just increase the tempo of the sequence here and possibly if I want to make it less complex because as soon as you get things going faster you want less complex things you can reduce the branches for example and just keep it super less complex and of course reduce the reverb as you go into something a bit more a bit more rhythmic right um, percussion next I'm going to use um, I'll leave the bass drum going and take the reverb off so I'm going to use uh, Hemispheres, this um, Euclidean Rhythm, and this is a straightforward patch because it's already been clocked on um, sixteenths. So I'll just take the output of Circle 1, because there's two of them, and we'll give it a lead, into the Pico Drum, which I'm going to use as a bit of hi hat type thing. Um, and you can hear it slightly off beat there so i'm going to go into the hemispheres two here and adjust the outer circle which is this one so i'm going to make it sort of faster i'm going to perhaps put five over threes and um, to get that sort of trippy trip hoppy uh, triplet feel at least and i've got control then of during the performance of um, things like the decay. Um, and I'm thinking about modulation as well, so I'm playing with some of these parameters. What effect does it have? And I can immediately put a modulation on that. Sometimes I'll, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes I'm already pre-thinking that sounds a bit boring by itself. So let's see what happens when we modulate it a bit. modulate it off sequence so that otherwise it will become boring again. I kind of want to get to the point where it never sounds the same twice. And Pico Drum has got a range of different voices or bass waveforms that we can go through. So I'll try um, that more snare type thing. So that's been modulated by this LFO. I think on a basic sine wave I can change the shape of the LFO during performance. Uh, let's try it with a bit of a sequence. Just fix the tuning again. It becomes more evident as you go through the patch what needs a bit of tuning. So just one step on this mini synth. This is number one.
So I'm also thinking of the stereo as I'm going through here. Let's turn the percussion off. Leave the bass drum on. So I've got the pluck on the right side. Thinking of the mixing. Just to balance things out, and I've got this sequence, which I can make shorter. On the left side of the speaker. Mini Simp 1. I'll call them yeah, track 1, track 2. And already I'm thinking that step sequence is not brilliant so let's put a branch on it <coughs> drink and because I've got separate volume on the, the percussion or let's call that track we up to track 10 I can bring that in and out and control the decay so it's good for the kind of build up build ups I haven't got mute buttons on, on the mix, which would be great, because you can obviously go back to this sort of beat. That was on a random waveform, let's, let's leave it on a straightforward. So you could go into sort of a bit of a breakdown, gradually increase. So this big reverb. This reverb is probably not appropriate for anything rhythmic for the moment. But then, gradually increase that and then reduce the decay and then bring the other sequences back in. Thinking all the time of how that would work in performance. Um, right, so we've got one, two, um, three, four things going. Just two sequences and a... Um, and the two percussions. Let's um, let's bring a bass in. So I've dedicated this mini synth up here to sort of bass lines and low things. So it's in an ambient piece. It's, it's sort of drones and things. Um, I'm going to use the Enigma from Hemispheres uh, to trigger that. And I've got the note on output one. So that should be a straightforward. Pull that across over to here. And that's down a mixer two. And you can hear it playing there. Very slow. And I'll also use the gate from there. Because uh, you can choose uh, output B from this um, Enigma machine. What you want that to be. So I'm going to use that as the gate. And this is where um, PAMS comes in handy, because I do do a lot now with PAMS on the fly, uh, so fiddling around the cables. Um, don't know what sort of bass to start with. But this can be a lot faster, so I just need to go into the output to Hemisphere 1, which is uh, uh, PAM track out for three and then I can just change the multiplier here to increase the tempo of that and obviously during performance I can change the Turing sequence depending on what I feel like I could also send a random CV and that's why I've got these random modules scattered around to change the one of 32 I think it is or um, four times eight yeah little sequences that are already pre-programmed into here I can change them as well put my own sequences in it's kind of a bit too fast I might just slow it down to half speed depends how it fits with the other parts so this is when you're creating a patch you sort of go right how does that work with the rest of it so you bring the sequences back in Tune the bass in a second. The percussion. Oh, um, this is where quantizers come in handy. I just realised this is um, this is coming out of hemispheres unquantized, which is why I have a few of the quantizers scattered around now. <coughs> Excuse me. So I can, sorry, take the CV from the hemispheres Turing and go into 2HP Tune, which is 
not by chance, just sat by the side of of the uh, miniature synth here. So now we, we bring that into tune, and then I probably need to tune the synth. And this is set to a C minor at the moment. I can also change the scaling of all the quantizers. Uh, this this is my favourite one, the TikTok one, because it's got a keyboard. This one you sort of just set the scale. But this one you can be very specific about the notes that play. Let's see if that's in tune. Sometimes when I'm tuning, I'll go higher in the <coughs> higher in the register, just so I can hear it in relation to other instruments. Remember, once you've got this the tuning set, you're sort of ready for the patch then. If you are struggling with uh, tuning, by the way, just turn everything off, including the bass drum, um, you can resort to a trusty tuner. So sometimes um, you can make it all relative to each other, or you can actually use a tuner. So I've got this little thing connected to the output of the camera, actually, just so I can tune it. I could have doubled from the main output. You can see it's a bit flat. And that's it, so when you get desperate. I don't know if that's going to be tuned with everything else because I may have, everything might be slightly out. Sounds okay. I'll do, see how it works with the bass drum. Remember, um, <coughs> the key to all of this is thinking about the flexibility of how that may develop. So everything from making it more, more sort of acidy, if I want to, um, changing up the tempo, changing the sequence of notes, percussion. go from that and within a couple of seconds drop the percussion drop the rate and all of a sudden you can go a bit more ambient with it longer decays uh, probably went too slow there bring in a second waveform in here so it's about thinking of how you can go from like a fast acidy type thing into suddenly something a bit more dark and experimental. It's a little bit fast. And just um, having PAMs, obviously when you're in performance mode with PAMs, you're often just flicking between the different outputs and changing the output. Um, divisions. So let's go back to a, a two, which is the standard one I'll use. Bass drum. One of the uh, key ones that are missing is a bit of harmonic content. Obviously if I'm playing live, which I like to do with uh, this Q Nexus, which is midded into the disting, or I can actually duplicate that as well. I sometimes have, for example, this um, doubled up on the CV and then I can have the disting and something else playing simultaneously. But uh, in, during a performance you kind of want little 
more freedom uh, in terms of being able to improvise on, on this for example and have some harmonic content changing the background so what I'm going to use for that is uh, this Turing machine another one which is just sort of sort of random but musical in nature I'm going to have that triggered by a slow clock on PAMS I think it's like 150 vision um, <coughs> getting a bit OCD with the cables here I'm trying to protect access to Steppy here so that's being triggered uh, by PAMS number 6 uh, very slow, I don't know if you can see the little light coming on the output from that I'm going to send into the tip top quantizer again trying to protect access to the keyboard on that one so sometimes I'll do this when particularly um, if you're creating a patch for a live show you don't want you actually want sort of holes that you can get into the main bits I know it's a bit anal and then the output from this one I'm going to multiply because I'm going to use two of them I'm going to put one of them into disting so it's just playing one note every now and then so I'm going to use this multiplier here which is a buffered multiplier which you need of course for um, CVs because buffered means it will give you an exact duplicate on the output you can use the non-buffered ones like these two for things like gates where it's less critical in terms of the exact voltage but anyway so that one I'm going to split into two one of them is going to go into this always on twin waves two which is going to be like a string sound Let's see what it's doing nothing at the moment Oh, because it's on a very slow gate, so um, it'll be triggering every... Oh, sorry, the other thing I forgot to mention. Uh, with twin waves, I like to um, filter because there it doesn't come with an envelope or filtering, just straight sort of wavetables type stuff. So I often put number two through the wasp so I can modulate this. This is, a, this is set to like a dual saw wave and see me modulating it manually there but I'll just leave it that for now and that's playing this C minor sequence and I've got control over the octaves of that and also I can take notes in and out of the scale so if I just wanted it say a C an E flat and an A flat coming from the Turing machine being controlled by these 50 visions from PAMS so let's get rid of the bass, doesn't make a lot of sense in this context, the bass drum. So that will create some harmonic content. Let's have it over a sequence. May have to just check the tuning. I'll go based on this uh, chord tuner. <coughs> Because one thing you want is to make sure that these, this sort of backing, I'll call it backing pad or strings, is in tune. Yeah, it sounds, it's pretty good actually. It just sounds a bit weird, I think, because it's um, got a lot of harmonic content, particularly when you, you're sending it through this wasp. And I'm going to double that one, like I said, with the disting, so it's like a um, an extra voice. So I'm just going to take the um, output of the quantizer, the Turing machine, and also I need to double the clock because the disting needs a uh, gate as well. So this is where these little malts come in handy over here. Again, thinking of the patching rather anally. So I'm going to use this bottom malt here just to distribute that slow clock that I've just been discussing. So I'm going to output 6, going to go into there, so we're getting the change. And now I can take another gate down to the disting from there. I'm using a yellow one for this because often I disconnect the disting gate. So that's now doubling up that note. And it's the sort of thing you can introduce, you can have it sort of quite sparse. And um, the advantage
advantage is you can just start with this sort of drippy electric piano-y type sound from the disting being sent from Turing randomly a few more notes just adding in F and G there allowing me to play over the top of it get super ambient Sound a bit dawsy there. And with that type of thing, you perhaps slowly introduce a bit of percussion. So this is maybe how I start the piece, just nice and gentle, with this auto playing um, coming from the um, drawing machine through the quantizer. And then a bit later in the piece, I can add in, as it starts to develop, in this twin waves oscillator too, for example, just to gradually increase the, um, the drive of the harmonic content. All the time, of course, I can switch to um, output 6, it's currently on 5th division, and if I wanted to, I could make that super fast. I'm not sure I'd want to, but it might be a bit something a bit experimental later. the octave with the, which is why it's nice on the left hand here, over here, or I can control it on the disc thing as, as well because it's close to hand. So I've um, lifted the whole multi-sample up at the same time, but sometimes you want it on the external controller gear. Right, and if I want to stop that sequence, which is um, the annoying thing, if you're multiplying like the output from something on the Turing machine, you can't say, you know, stop playing. So often I'll just have this loose, this um, gate, so that it stops playing. That allows me, to, for example, to open with manual playing. And then at some point, you know, just in the background, imagine I've got a left hand going. Just adding that little um, step sequence in, uh, drawing sequence. Right, we're kind of almost there. I'm, you know, the one of the tendencies is with modular is, is to use everything. You think you've got to use everything. With this particular piece, I, I decided to use everything just because I want to bring things in, out, in and out, different types of things without repatching, which is often the case with the performance. So, um, for example, um, let's have a listen to the whole thing and make a decision about what we might need. This isn't necessarily um, anything like how the final piece will turn out, but it's kind of how everything mixes together. So you've sort of got a thinking, yeah, a bit of sort of door mode, how, how, how a final mix is going to sound together. Has it got all the elements? So the block is a bit loud.
right. Like I said, the the only thing that's missing, I think, is something a bit more um, crazy on the on melodic rhythm. So this is where I'm going to use uh, PAMS in one of its lesser used modes, I suppose. I'm going to take a random wave out of output 8. So let's um, go to output 8, long press, and choose a random wave, because it's got your basic square pulse type wave, which is used for clocking. And now we're going to go to uh, the random one and take that output into um, uh, twin waves oscillator one so you won't hear anything yet because this needs to be gated and I'm going to use how many gates have I got left I've got uh, sorry steppies I've got output C which I'll use for this so let's see what output C is doing track C it's um, a straightforward thing. Let's see how that sounds. And then again with the twin waves, I filter it through. I'm going to use this um, multi-mode VCF here. So what you're hearing there is all from PAMS more or less, apart from the gate, but um, I could have gated as well from here. Um, and it's quantized, so I'm actually switching to quantize. I think I've got it set to the random wave output, set to um, PM, which is pentatonic minor, the small m. And the important thing with this is looping, so at the moment that's not being looped. Remember the trigger's coming from gate C, so during a performance I can change, for example, the probability. I've also got filtering on this, I think there's a bandpass filter on it. Yeah, I've set it to bandpass on this multi-mode. Because again, you're thinking of you're thinking of um, how this is going to fit in the mix as well. You don't want everything in the sort of um, uh, low pass filtered, so everything's shifted towards a, mu a muddy finish. So I, I like to have some things that stand out. And the other thing I like to introduce with this one is the uh, the pip slope. So I'm going to make it. Uh, controllable from a uh, attack decay perspective. So I'm putting it through this ADSR pip slope. That allows me to go from that type of sound Hi Philip, yeah I don't know what the crackling is. It could be <coughs> could be the um, camera overloaded. Thanks for telling me before I go into any kind of proper performance. I'm actually going to turn the output to the camera down and then increase the camera, uh, increase the camera input. Tell me if it improves. I'm actually recording this by the way completely separately on, um, I've got a 24 bit 96 kilohertz recorder sat by the side here which is over there crackling seems to have lost a few a few viewers so tell me if that has improved it may be my voice just being a bit boomy pushing the um, pushing the thing the main thing is that I don't want the music to be overloading the um, this recorder Sorry, back to that last voice, which is a sort of, um, kind of think of it as a bit of a rhythm guitar type thing. And long press here, uh, I can change the resolution of it. So we'll go, let's go to 16th on the notes. And then because I've got a separate control over the gates, I can go 16th on the clock as well. Alright, long press again just to go into the notes because the, the thing with the random wave is it's constantly random. So if I want to 
definitely the um, definitely the microphone there. I'll just turn off, turn the low down, my overall mic volume. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, so the random waveform is just going to keep playing random. Sometimes though, you want it to capture a bit, so you put loop mode on on the pans, and that's now just going to loop a short two-step sequence. Let's ask it to loop four, four parts. Might go back to just fine-tuning this because I haven't really set this one up at all. And the probability here, can take it back to full probability. So you're getting a nice melody. Hams is playing the melody here. If I wanted to go in and change that melody, I'll just go back to uh, the loop, take it back to zero, and it will then generate some more randoms. And at any point if I want to freeze one of those, I'll put it into loop mode. Controlling the ADSR here for those weird breakdown type things. And you hear, because I've been fitting around with the clock there, as I mentioned at the beginning, Steppy's gone a little out of time with PAMs. So this is be a case where you could perhaps um, hide it by going like that and then just restart it. And the ADSR's putting it slightly out of time as well. Okay, so we haven't got any questions. Everyone seems to have gone just as I'm about to go into performance. But what I like to do with these things is obviously talk through um, how it's patched and then do a performance, which, like I said, is often different from the original patch. Testing the um, volume of things. Um, part of the uh, patching before a performance, of course, is to make sure that you're um, not overloading things. So you often choose um, test the overall levels. Bring in players like the, um, the bass drum. So Kangam said that's there's the jam. Uh, I'm not sure what that was referring to. Yeah I mean most most jams you listen to tend to be um, like a kick drum like that with a bit of rhythm and then they just add that type of thing. sort of techno orientated. Perhaps a bit more filtered. And some people will let that play for 10 minutes, occasionally adding in um, something else. Uh, little blips and bops every now. sort of playing an actual tune on a keyboard. There's an anathema sometimes. So I'm just fiddling with the levels again. Tell me if that's crackling.
um, uh, an extra channel free here because I, I sometimes have like a micro freak or something. nice and quiet and then gradually building into different areas so I've gone on way too long um, talking uh, well 110 about 10 minutes over all gone excellent right so let's do a little performance I'm gonna have a uh, quick drink So no actual questions. And the joy of doing lives when <laughs> there's no sort of technical questions or anything. So I'm guessing everything's been super well explained, which is great. Wearing my teacher hat. If uh, no one's asking questions, there's two things going on. One of them is they're totally bored and or not paying attention is in the background and they're playing with the phones. Or it's um, been so well explained that um, it uh, makes perfect sense and they understand everything which is great so nothing complicated here so let's go into a performance like I said just as a brief overview everything has been designed so I can take every voice into a different direction depending on where I want to go at that moment and that's the joy of improvisation everything from sequence patterns and how they mutate and change right through to filtering and uh, envelopes on things through to uh, actual harmonic content in which notes are playing um, I can achieve similar on the door but modular different story for me yeah um, uh, sure you can do everything on the door um, and I use those as well uh, it depends on how immediate want you want things I know with a door it tends to be, um, you know, you, you put a layer down, or if you've got a controller, you're just controlling a lot of VSTs, everything's on the screen. Um, I suppose one advantage of modular is you can do two or three or even four things simultaneously. I can be adjusting volumes in real time, filtering, I can be adjusting sounds, I can be adjusting harmonic content, all within milliseconds of each other or partial seconds whereas a door tends to be mouse click change that mouse click change that so everything just feels a bit stepped um, when you're doing things on a door if, you, if you're using a controller yeah you can get it sort of a nice performance thing going on as well but um, it's I suppose the popularity of modular is uh, in itself explains why people do it and don't just you know do a lot of screen staring and mousing which is the the door side I do you know I do that as well and it's it's primarily for if I'm doing commission pieces or music film music and things where you can be very uh, you have to actually be <coughs> have everything adjustable so you've recorded something and everything can be moved around changed edited um, the uh, modular is very much real time so the performance I'm going to do now is just going to be a moment in time never going to be able to be repeated uh, from a chain a performance perspective and never going to be able to be um, um, changed you know you can't go in halfway through a modular performance and go I'll just twiddle that sound even the mixing um, I could you know 
potentially have separate outputs and then remix them all on the door, but that would take as long as the performance. So for me, it's, it's a time question as well. Just set a patch up, get something that's a good base, and then just kind of go for it. So thanks for that question, Cambo. It was, um, yeah, still learning. Um, yeah, I got tired of the mouse because I've been using doors since the very first ones, the Atari STs. I was actually teaching Cubase at various colleges and universities back in the 80s in Manchester, around the Manchester music scene. So I've been using them for, um, what, 40 years, shows you how old I am. And um, after a while it does become a little jarring, I suppose, constantly using screen-based or de developing things on screens, uh, whereas the immediacy of doing it this way is, is quite satisfying. Right, thanks everyone. Um, I'm not going, I'm just um, saying goodbye to my voice, because I'm going to turn that off now, we're going to go into performance mode, no idea where this will go, and that's another advantage, because I've got ten tracks all playing different things, no idea which direction they're going to go in, whereas the door, you tend to be a little more intentional and prescriptive, I'm going to do the bass drum, then I'm going to do a bass, then I'm going to do the hi-hats, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to add the keyboard, then I'm going to do this, and it um, tends to be a bit like that, I think, you know, it's all about just adding layers, which is a um, totally different type way of doing things. Right, see you on the other side.